Good morning, everybody. Democratic candidate for United States Senate Tom Nelson is my very special guest today, Thursday, March 4th, 2021. I'm Ben Dryden. A quick programming note. As you know, our Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy show last Tuesday was canceled. Uh, just Fitzy and the team and the SWAT team are out busting bad guys. Uh, but we will be back next Tuesday for a regular scheduled show. We're going to have a lot to talk about. And then one week from today, I'll be uh, joined once again by Congressman Tom Tiffany for our monthly Breakfast with Tiffany show. But today, I'm very excited to welcome, for the first time on the show, Mr. Tom Nelson. Tom, good morning, sir. How are you? Great to be on, and I guess good to be home, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I went to your uh, uh, I went to your Wikipedia page this morning, because I really try not to get to know uh, first-time guests too much before they come on. I kind of want to learn organically and right. kind of at the same time a lot of others do. And I know about you, but I went to your Wikipedia page, and wow, there's a lot of stuff on there. And I didn't realize how far back your political cu- career goes. And I can't wait to get into all of that stuff. Um, and I know you have some ties to Spooner, right? Yes. Part uh, of the North. Yeah. Northwest, yeah. Western Wisconsin. Yeah. So there's a lot of that stuff I want to get into. But first and foremost, of course, um, first time on, <clears throat> excuse me, tell us a little about you before you got into politics, where you were born, where you were raised, some schooling, things you did after school, and then what led you to get into politics to begin with. Well, I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and my dad, a uh, Lutheran pastor, was just finishing up seminary school. So we were there, and then about two months, three months, we moved to my dad's first call, which was um, a small Lutheran church in the town of Lund, right on the county line of Pierce and Pepin County called Sabie Lund Lutheran Church. So we were there for four years. So I spent the first four years of my life in western Wisconsin. Uh, the Nelsons moved to the Fox Valley in 1980 and that's where my dad started a mission church also as of course pastor we i grew up in little shoe which is close by to appleton and uh, graduated in 94 went to a small college in minnesota called carlton yeah. um got my master's degree out east um, and then came back and ran for office in my ran for office in my hometown um after it had switched hands from a democrat to a republican and kind of on, you know, this is something that I wanted to do. I wanted to serve my community. The opportunity was there. Went out, knocked on about 22,000 doors and won. That's and it. I think that kind of goes to the core of, you know, why I got into service in the first place. And there's always a reason. There's always an experience, a form of event. And for me, it was the fact that I grew up on this blue-collar neighborhood in Little Shoe. All the dads worked at a paper mill or, you know, except for the Lutheran pastor, my dad. And I saw firsthand um, what the middle class needs and how it was important to my upbringing and what it meant for my friends and their family. And I ended up working at a paper mill hauling pulp um, one summer uh, uh, during college. I bust tables at the local supper club, stock shelves. In the summer, I bailed hay at my uncle's farm at in, uh, in Clayton, Clear Lake, again, right on the um, on the border from the two. My dad went to Clear Lake High School, graduated sometime in the 1960s. And I think if you look at uh, my, my experience, and this is a big reason why I'm running, it's it's pretty different than Senator Johnson. And simply what I want to do is I want to make the economy work for everyone. Mm-hmm. Not just people in a position of privilege, but everyone. The working families on Carolyn Drive, uh, the farm families in Clear Lake and Clayton, the small businesses up and down the street, and up and down the main streets across the state, including in downtown Spooner with bookstores. Yeah, so bookstores. So you're going to have to explain that for uh, people who don't know your connection yeah. here to a Spooner bookstore. Right. And so my cousin is Carol Dunn, who, of course, runs the bookstore in downtown Spooner. It has been for several years. I haven't been there for some time, though, but I know that she's certainly made quite a name for herself. Yeah. And then, of course... Uh, Jamie, um, my cousin, so Carol is through marriage, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Jamie has uh, done a lot of work uh, for natural resources for the DNR and has uh, done, you know, done, done great work. And so it's, um, you know, so that's my uh, my connection to Spooner. And then if you go down the street um, to Barron, or, or I should say across on, on, on mm-hmm. 
I had uh, cousins in Barron. Uh, my, my grandfather and grandmother retired to Amory. And then if you go further down, you have my other uncle and cousins in Spring, Maryland. Wow. It's a huge swath going down western Wisconsin, getting <laughs> at Church, Spring Valley, Amory, Barron, Spooner. Uh, what did you get your master's degree in? Uh, it was in public affairs, public oh. international affairs. Did you, so was this, uh, when you were younger, were you always interested in politics in public affairs or is this one of those i mean i think most people probably when when you're gonna go to a ma- get a master's degree you know what you want to do going into that did you know that this would likely be an outcome or you just wanted to be in that field somewhere um it really goes back to you know you know for me it's you know, you know my upbringing and you know on that block and carolyn driving a little shoe but also my father who was a pastor quite on quite a few years ago um, and he found his calling um, in the ministry. And likewise, I found my way um, serving my community in elective office. And it's something that I learned, maybe not electorally, electoral politics, mm-hmm. but I think the fundamental importance, fundamental importance of serving your community. And there's a lot of ways to do it. And this is just one way that I found in something that's Quite frankly, it's been an honor. It's been an absolute privilege and honor to be able to serve the people of Ottagamie County. Before that, in the 5th Assembly District, which includes part of Ottagamie and Brown County, a little bit of Shawano County. And so that is perfect for, what year was that? Was a, Oh, I saw that on your Wikipedia page, which I don't know if it's accurate or not, because it's Wikipedia. Uh, what year did you run for Assembly? 2004. Okay. So 2004, yeah, so that was uh, some time ago. It doesn't really seem like that long ago, but yeah. it does. And the interesting thing, though, is when I was elected, I was the youngest person in the state assembly. And now in this potential field of Senate campaign candidates, at least on the Democratic side, I will be the oldest. <laughs> so it really has come full circle. <laughs> nice. Nice. And you were in for uh, how many terms? Three? Three terms. Three terms. Yeah. And, and oh, what four, was your— oh, six, eight. What was your experience like in the assembly? Well, it was really interesting because I really went, you know, the gamut of beginning in the minority. My second term, uh, the Senate, the state Senate was the Democrat majority. And then my third and last term was when there was a Democrat majority in both houses and the governor. And I was majority leader at that time. And that was a pretty interesting perspective. It's a lot different then than it is now. And those were one of those rare opportunities you really had, I think, to make a really significant impact in people's lives. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can serve people and the kind of effect that you can have, whether you are, if you are parties in the polling party or not. And I say that because it really does make a difference. When the Republicans are charged, you have Republican bills, Republican author bills. When the Democrats aren't charged, it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be in a position to pass laws, that's just the fact of the matter. Yeah. And um, But I look at my three terms, and it goes from completely completely out of a position, then backbencher, halfway in between, and then finally um, in the majority. And a lot of folks really don't have that kind of experience. The Democrats right now, I mean, in a deep majority, I mean, in a deep minority. Mm. And people just aren't going to have that kind of opportunity. I was fortunate to be in that position. Mm. So that's something that has not been lost. And then going on a county executive, which is, you know, a completely different beast. So to speak. Well, so will you, uh, did you decide to leave assembly? Uh, what was your transition from that? And what did, what's that? I ran for lieutenant governor, so it was a 2010 election for lieutenant governor. Sure, so didn't work. <laughs> when you made that decision, is that uh, was that an easier? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're, you're you're you have to leave your assembly job. Was it a difficult decision to make? Not really. I mean, I've always considered myself uh, to be a populist in the sense that my service is really grounding the people. And it goes to my very first election, the grounding serving people in my community. My dad went door to door. We started his church. I did the same thing when I ran for the state assembly, um, literally walking his footsteps because there are a lot of houses and blocks that I knocked on that he did 24 years earlier when he started his church. 
is that's when you start a church. Same thing, you start a business. You know, you start cold calling. You start knocking on doors. Same thing for an assembly race. And so that is my grounding. That is my core. And I saw um, to be able to go out to the state, go to the people. And I put about 60,000 miles in my car back in 2010. Find out what is important to people in their communities. Find out the common bond across Wisconsin. Mm. These are very important things to find out what type of issue that you should address. And knowing that issues like healthcare, that's something that affects rural communities, suburban, urban, the economy, the same thing too. And so in that respect, it really wasn't that difficult. Mm. Like I said before, it didn't work out, but you know, and I always went above. Sure. So then you, what did you do after that? Ran for county executive. So that's the spot I've been in since then. So I ran, it was the spring of 2011, picked myself up, ran for county executive in my home county. So that was 2011, uh, won election in 15 and 19. So this is the really, really fun stuff. See, in the legislature, you're writing laws and you have this platform and you can talk about issues. Very, very important there. But when you look at local government, such position with like county executive, we have about 23 different departments, 23 departments, everything from an international airport to recycling operation to criminal justice treatment and services department. And that's just three of the 23. That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where you can see the fruits of your labor. You can see every day the impact that you are having on people's lives. So, and it's not just in the sheriff's department pe pulling people over for speeding. That's not what I'm talking right, about. Right, yeah. <laughs> Like our airport, our airport is probably the most important piece of economic real estate in Northeast Wisconsin because it contributes about $700 million worth of economic activity at an airport. So we've got 14 direct flights, four major carriers. We have one of the largest facilities and operations for Gulfstream outside their headquarters in Georgia. They've got about a thousand employees there. All told, the airport supports directly or indirectly over 3,000 jobs. When I took over back in 2011, we did very well. We had about $400 million of economic activity, and we've almost doubled that in 10 years. And that's just one example. So you can see how many you know, jobs you're supporting. These are good quality paying jobs. Um, the Gulfstream positions um, do very, very well. You have mechanics at Air Wisconsin. You have the front office, um, um, corporate headquarters for Air Wisconsin, all great things and all things that I'm, you know, I'm not taking credit for. We've got an airport director who does fantastic work. He's got a great staff, our tenants, everything from Air Wisconsin, Gulfstream to the four major carriers. We have a partnership with Fox Lake Technical College, a training facility where people all over the country go to do all kinds of training. Great stuff. So now you're 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 talking about the rubber meets the road, and then you decided I'm running for senate. So what was that decision like? Uh, I mean, uh, how did you come up with that? Was it just you woke up one day and said, "I, I know what I'm doing," or is this something that it's been people may maybe been asking you, or you've been thinking about? Uh, how did that decision come to be? I think it's all of the above, and when I say all of the above. Um, I looked at my experience as county executive before that being in the state assembly and really having an understanding of what it means, you know, what they're, you know, what folks are going through. And I think this election cycle is a tailor made election cycle for a local official to run for the U.S. Senate. In Washington, there really has not been a lot of leadership before President Biden dealing with COVID. You know, people like Ron Johnson who have obstructed and make things very difficult. I mean, he's voted against two or three COVID relief bills. We need leadership in Washington and we were not getting it. Back home in Madison, you have a Republican majority that's been jamming the governor for the last year is just trying to keep people safe. So you have those problems in Madison, Washington, but you still have a pandemic that you're trying to get through. So it falls to local government. It falls to county administrators, county executives, um, um, city mayors and so forth who are on the front lines. And that's exactly what we did in Outagamie County. We had to fight tooth and nail uh, to try to get a testing facility. We are the ones, um, Outagamie County was one of the first 
uh, to close down non-essential op operations. It was about almost a year ago to make sure that we're keeping our employees and the public safe. And now with the local health systems and local public health jurisdictions, we are running, we set up and are running our own vaccination clinic. So when I say it's tailor-made, a pandemic should be dealt with at a national level. It's not. It's being done at a local level. And if we can take on a pandemic, if we can lead during a pandemic, um, there's really not much you can't do. Sure. And I think that in and of itself gives great standing for a local official because we're the ones who've been on the front line to know how this has affected the communities. And then what needs to be done differently, um, God forbid this happens again. So I think we're uniquely positioned to do that. And then going full circle to that little four-year-old on Carolyn Drive, my friends – you know, their dads work in the paper mills, the moms, school teachers, the middle class, like, you know, the American dream, where we were at 30, 40 years ago. I want to get back to that place. Yeah. The way you get back to that place is you start working on the economy. You figure out, like, how to make the economy work for everyone. And that's not happening. Go to folks in Spooner. Go to folks in Barron, Superior, Little Shoe, Cuba City. You know, it's not working for everyone. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do. So that's a big reason why I decided to run for the Senate. And uh, uh, you brought up that you had worked in a paper mill when you were in college, I believe. Um, you've brought up paper mill a couple of times, which is, this is a, probably a good time to bring this up, that I went to your website this morning, uh, Nelson for Wisconsin, or is it for WI? Nelson yeah, for WI.com. WI. And it said here in 2017, I joined the United Steelworkers in helping save a paper mill that had been auctioned off to an industrial scrap dealer. Today, the mill is alive and well and supports 300 jobs, which leads me into a book that you have just written called One Day Stronger. Tell us about that. Well, thank you for the question. That was a 22-month project. So it goes back to a fight that I undertook in 2017. In the local paper mill had been over 120 years old, had been the cornerstone socially, politically, economically, culturally for 120 years, went under. It's going under, it went into receivership, which is a draconian version of bankruptcy. The mill was sold to a scrap dealer from California. So... They were going to scrap it. They were going to get rid of this legacy 120 years. So the mill was organized, United Steelworkers. United Steelworkers and I got together and said, we can do this. Let's fight back. And so we objected to this sale, even though receivership is usually a death certificate for a business. There's a little tiny provision in it that allows a party withstanding. Could be workers, could lose their jobs, could be a um, county executive who's going to lose $300 million worth of economic activity in his or her county. We objected to it and we prevailed on this judge, the county judge, to give us a second chance. We had a bit where they had a business model that could make money and they were very profitable. They showed the owner that we can run a mill, we can turn a profit. We brought 300 workers back. And it was a huge success story. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book on this. So I wrote a book about this topic, the fight to do. But it's more than just that. It's about how a community came together and how we show this example, how you can form a tripartite model, so to speak, of local business labor and local government coming together to save a mill. And the model that we used in Appleton Code and Combined Locks, Nottingham County back in 2017, 2018, was replicated in Park Falls, nearby Park Falls, with the Flambeau River paper. They, too, went into receivership. And it was members of the USW, and it was some attorneys who were involved in that. And I kind of helped in um, sort of a kind of an informal kind of consulting basis. Mm -hmm. And we were able to or they were able to turn that around. And so the Flambeau River paper is now alive and well, supporting lots of jobs, and had it not been for, I believe, I believe, had it not been for the Appleton Coded case example of what we did, I don't think that they would have been able to save Flambeau River paper. Yeah. So the success we had in combined locks is the same success that the folks in Park Falls experienced last year. Well, forgive my ignorance here, because I really don't know how this works. Receivership, um, 
what would take a business or, or lead a business to be in that position? I'm just going to guess and say it wasn't, what, financially uh, productive enough, right? Not making enough, so we're just going to have to shut down. So what caused it to get to that point? And then how do you sure. then make it profitable? Obviously, the, I'm, sure, I'm assuming a lot of this is in the book. But, uh, man, that seems like, oh, okay, my business is going under and I can't afford to pay the bills. And then all of a sudden this happens and, hey, we're thriving now. Wow, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in between there, but is there a shorter version to this? Um, what what happened is there's 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 a couple of things, um, and I should also say too when I say Park Falls, I, mean, I realize it's about an hour fifteen minutes, hour and a half away from Splinter, though. But I imagine there are some folks that have access to this, so perhaps they're you know picking up on the story and they can see the history. Of this. Mm. What happened is you had this big bank. So here's another kind of strand plot line. You had this big bank, PNC Bank, which is one of the largest banks in the country. It was bailed out by the American people, billions of dollars. Not sure exactly what it was. And they ended up paying it back, though. But we were there, American Pat taxpayer during the bailout in the late 2000s, were there for them in their hour of need. So this same institution that taxpayers bailed out, they pulled the note, they called the note on Appleton coded and said, okay, we're done, pay us back, we're getting rid of this thing. So that's what happened. It shows the power of what these large banks have over a little tiny community like combined locks. And that's, that's you know, so there's a David and, David and Goliath scenario where yeah. anywhere else, receivership means the end of that business, the death of that mill. But had it not come, come you know, to these resourceful workers, um, I saw an opportunity to get in and change things. This mill would have been, um, it would have been a pile of rubble right now. Mm. This is an example. So you mentioned about, about receivership. It was the bank that owned the note to that mill that forced the receivership, that forced this process. In the first place. That's how we got to all of this. Where can people get that book, by the way? I went yesterday, and I thought it was supposed to be out because you and I had a brief conversation, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, uh, just about you know coming on and doing this. And I thought you had said it was going to be out on the same day that we're going to be doing the show. It, it just happened to be the same day. Yeah. But I think yesterday yeah, I yeah. saw somewhere, because I went, or it was this morning, because I went to your uh, uh, your Twitter page, just, I don't know, write down a couple notes for something to, I don't know, talk about. You can't have dead air when you're doing these things. Um, and I thought I saw it was not out yet. So where, what is the status of the book and where can people go and get it? Well, if you go to um, our website, um, the website is uh, One Day Stronger Book. So that's the name of the book, oh. One Day Stronger Book. And if you go there, um, you can find out all the you know different places that you can buy the book. And of course, um, you can always buy it at Northwind okay. Northwind Book in Fiverr, yes. Fiverr in downtown Spooner, as Carol, I'm sure that you know, it. But from the website, it gives us um, it gives a summary of the book, some of the history, um, some of the resources, a couple of testimonials and blurbs, and then also several ways to buy. It. You should do a book signing in Spooner. I should. Yeah. After COVID, let's do it definitely. All right, that'd be cool. So uh, on that note of the. Uh, Twitter. So I went through and I had wrote down three things this morning. One is minimum wage. Second is billboards because I'm, I'm going through your, your your Twitter feed and then you're asking people. I'm like, I don't even know what's going on there. And then something about the wealth tax. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to. Uh, obviously, this is kind of sure. more of a get to know you kind of a thing. But those three things appeared quite often or at least most recently on your Twitter feed. So I just wondered if you wanted to touch on any of those where you kind of stand right now on the minimum wage. Sure. Well, a couple of things. I'm going to be the progressive candidate. And so these bread and butter economic issues, that's going to be my calling card. These are the things I'm going to focus on in this campaign because that's my life. That's how I was brought up. I was brought up in this modest working uh, working family neighborhood and I know these issues. I'm also gonna be probably the only one in the race that's not gonna be able to self fund. I'm kind of gonna be like living a Bernie Sanders stump speech, millionaires and billionaires. So it's not surprising that these type of issues pop up. Minimum wage, I'm very much for $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, the wealth tax simply says if you make more than $50 million dollars a year 50 million dollars a year you pay an extra two cents on that margin 
So that, I mean, that's something I think if you make $50 million, you can afford that kind of, you know, wealth tax, if you want to call it that way. These are really simple things. Yet when you go to Washington, it really is a foreign concept. And you got to really kind of change this mindset. The only way to change this mindset is you got to get fresh blood. You got to get new folks. In. You got to have people that have a background, whether or not, you know, you you know, you grew up on Carolyn Drive, Little Shoot, whether or not you were on County Road F outside of um, Amory. Um, if you grew up on uh, Paulson Lake in Clayton, doesn't matter. I mean, these are issues that affect everyone. And it takes someone with that kind of background, that kind of upbringing, that kind of life experience to go to that has that value set. That is your core to go to Washington and make those kind of constructive changes that are going to help working families all over this state. Carolyn Drive, farm families, whether it's agricultural issues, manufacturing issues, it doesn't matter what it is. This is a type of approach. These are the type of issues you have to focus on. If you're going to make a positive impact in people's lives. Yeah. And that's the only reason why you shouldn't run for office in the first place, in my humble opinion. Billboards. You had put up a tweet. Of, uh, it was a, a poll about what next billboard should you run? And I didn't get a chance to actually look at what the, the options were. I wish I would have. That was right before we went on. So what is this about billboards? Well, we had this, you know, in, in, in kind of, uh, you know, in campaigns, especially a campaign that's going to be 24 months long. you got to be creative. And so what yeah. we did is we put a couple examples of billboards, put it on social media and said, okay, here are four examples. Which billboard do you want us to put up? And so there are a number of billboards along Highway 41. And we have one billboard that we are going to advertise this. It's going to be pretty close to where Ron Johnson is. It's going to be his home or adopted home. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so, right, right. So, it's gonna be fun things like that. Take yeah. a look at it too. I think on um, pinned to the top, you'll have a video where I'm having a garage sale. I'm having a garage sale because I cannot self fund my campaign. I got a fellow <laughs> who is a billionaire. I may have someone else who is a millionaire. Yeah. And that's another theme thing too. You know, there's Wall Street or there's Main Street. I'm going to be the Main Street candidate. That's yeah. where I am from. I mean, two thirds, two thirds of the U.S. Senate are millionaires. I'm not a millionaire. Okay. So I think that we should get that one third into the majority. Because again, majority, you're going to need to have a majority vote to be able to take on these issues and to affect change. Mm -hmm. I'm not a millionaire. I'm not going to be able to self fund my race. I'm going to put Main Street before Wall Street. That is my public service in the assembly, prioritizing these issues for working families is county executive growing the local economy, doubling the economic impact of our little old county airport that is now an international airport that supports directly or indirectly 3,000 jobs. So I've got the track record, got some of the experience, and I think I come from a good place, a place where my family comes from in Polk County, growing up in the Fox Valley, a modest working class family neighborhood, mm -hmm. all important things. And... Billboards are part of the campaign, videos, having a garage sale, trying to raise money, selling my kids dinosaurs, toy dinosaurs, so I can match these millionaires and billionaires. Got a long ways to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, um, what grade uh, would you give Ron Johnson? Is this a F or is there any, well, you know, there is a couple things that uh, you didn't suck at doing, I guess. Or is it just flat, man, there's no there's no room here. It's just terrible. F minus. F minus minus. I mean, look, Ron Johnson, when it comes to politics and business, I mean, there's just no way. I mean, he, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Good for him. You know, he's made millions of dollars. He's done well for himself. Okay. Well, married into, I mean, his father-in-law was a billionaire. Okay. So we had a, you know, we had a little bit of advantage here though. Okay. So, so, I mean, so good for you. Then you got to give back to your community and going to Washington and voting for these tax cuts for the very rich, ignoring the COVID, you cannot I mean the COVID crisis, ignoring the economic crisis and now making, you know, having to read aloud a 600 page bill. I mean, these are just absurd things. There is nothing redeemable in that public servants mm. it really is and that's why we need a change you know uh the fights that i wage in the state of legis uh, in the state le legislature for senior care there was a two-week period when senior care was dead this is a very important program 
for those over 65 with limited incomes that, that, that qualify. It is a great program. And had, had we not fought that tooth and nail, we had um, a letter writing campaign. We went to Washington. We put legislation out there. We would never have been successful. You know, I mean, Ron Johnson, he voted to overturn the ACA. Think of how many millions of Americans have access to quality health insurance because of the ACA. And yet you got someone like Ron Johnson that has done a lot, has done, has dedicated his public service to trying to get rid of the ACA, something that has meant access to health care for millions of families. I didn't know that he married into family or the billions. So it sounds like what I'm hearing is I should reach out to him to see if he wants to do any advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Again, get me back. There's no reason why Ron Johnson should not advertise on dry. <laughs> I think he should do it right now. We'll He's charge him double. I won't tell. Got I won't, a lot of money. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Call him up. But, but careful, careful. You know, when I uh, talk to people about my campaign, the common message is he does not respond against state trade policy. Just so if you don't get your phone call returned, try again, try again, but it could be a fuel exercise. But yeah, get some money on it. <laughs> okay. What grade would you give? I know this isn't a Senate thing, but uh, obviously it's very big in Wisconsin. Uh, what grade would you give uh, Tony Evers uh, over his, what, just over two years now? You know, I would give him, overall, I give him an A minus A and grading on a curve. Right on a curve in A. And the reason why I say that is that he's gone up against so many insurmountable ob obstacles. He just wants to keep the people of Wisconsin safe. That's why there is a mask order. Think about this. The CDC is saying you need a double mask. And yet the state legislature is saying no mask. I mean, regardless of what's your opinion on it, when you look like when you look at someone like Tony Eagles, he's just trying to keep the state safe. I mean, that's what he should do. He had these executive powers. His, you know, before he was sued, his DHS secretary had these authorities that governors and health secretaries have had going back dozens of years, at least a hundred years, something like that. I mean, a long time. So you have this Republican legislature and you have this Democratic governor. And soon after, they're trying to take away these basic powers that a governor is given to someone who is duly elected by the people of the state. All right. Uh, well, that's all the stuff I had written down. We could talk forever about this stuff. And obviously, this was, uh, I think we talked at the very beginning that we really wanted this to be kind of get to know you kind of a thing. You are welcome on anytime you want. And we can get into more issues, more uh, specific topics, uh, if you would like. Is there any anything, uh, any last words, anything you want to say? I think we covered a lot. I think we should come back. Um, I'm going to be around. This is about a 20 month campaign. You know, a lot of places. As soon as the COVID clears, we're going to put thousands of miles. We're going to put the you know put the family in the minivan, the SUV, and we're just going to put on a lot of. I mean, we're going to go to Spooner. We're going to buy some books. We're going to go down to Clear Lake. We're going to milk some cows. Gross. You know, we're going down Wisconsin <laughs> Rapids. We're going to you know we're going to haul some pulp. We're doing it all. Okay, I'm not going to be around for those. I mean, just send pictures. <laughs> Thank you. And if people want to find out more information about you, they can go where? Nelson4wy.com. That's Nelson4wy.com. And then if you're interested in the book, hope you are, onedaystrongerbook.com, onedaystrongerbook.com. Get it at your favorite independent bookstore, especially those bookstores, independent bookstores in Spooner, which I hear is great. <laughs> Check it out. Literally, figuratively. All right. I'm going to call her after this and tell her that she owes us money for advertising now, too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Good to be on. Special thank you to my guest today, Democratic candidate for United States Senate, Tom Nelson. I'll see you right back here next week for another episode of Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy. And next Thursday... Uh, for our monthly Breakfast with Tiffany chat. Until then, stay safe, keep your social distance, and as always, have a blessed...